All right, so we're going to see now how to solve Euler equations. This is a set of uh, second order differential equations that are linear. Uh, they do have polynomial coefficients, very similar to the ones we were just doing with the power series. Um, but uh, there's a special format to them, and uh, we're going to use a completely different approach. Uh, you could think of what we did with the constant coefficient differential equations as a model. Remember there we said, well, look at how the derivatives are adding up to zero. I bet they're all e to the gamma x, right? And then we just figured out what gamma was by substituting. Um, somebody looked at this pattern and said, oh, well, look, when you take the derivatives, uh, you just increase the degree of the coefficient function, right? It's constant, then it's degree one, then it's degree two. And that probably makes you think of a monomial itself and the power rule, right? How as you take a derivative, the power decreases by one each time. So if somebody said, I think that, I guess Euler, <laughs> Euler said, I think that the solution will be something like x to the r. And then you just got to figure out what that exponent is. So uh, when you see this pattern um, where you can have constants in front, but it's got to have uh, x squared times the second derivative and x times the first derivative and just a constant times the function itself, all adding to 0, you can try this out. In our example, number one, we've got uh, a is 1, and b is negative 1, and c is negative 8. But for any Euler equation, you would suppose that the solution is y equals x to the r, where our goal is to figure out what r is. And r is just some number like 2 or 3, um, though I guess it could be a fractional value. right? So what are the derivatives of this? Well, we should know that. We've been doing that with the power series. Just use the power rule. Power rule, right? Uh, so the r comes out in front, and the exponent goes to r minus 1. Take a second derivative, and that r minus 1 goes out in front, and the exponent drops to r minus 2. Let's go ahead and substitute these into the differential equation, and hopefully we'll get an algebraic equation for r. So second derivative goes here, and first derivative goes here, and x to the r goes here. Now because of the pattern with x squared in the second derivative and x in the first derivative, you're always going to get x to the r in every term. You see how that works? Um, combining the x's using the rule for exponents and adding them. 2 plus r minus 2 is r, 1 plus r minus 1 is r, and so you're going to get uh, let's see, we have r times r minus 1 x to the r minus r x to the r minus 8 That means we can factor off that x to the r and remove it from the equation. And what's left is referred to as the characteristic equation for the Euler ODE. And you could jump from the differential equation right to this form of the characteristic when you start to be more familiar with how it always works. Because it's just going to be a times r, r minus 1, plus b times r, plus c, no, equal to 0. <laughs> this is, of course, a quadratic equation for r. So much like the constant coefficient ODs, uh, we can solve that using factoring of the quadratic formula. and we'll likely have three different cases, right? So let's solve this one and see what happens. I'm going to distribute it out first. So we get r squared 
And then I've got minus r, minus r, that's minus 2r, and then minus 8 equals 0. So that one looks like it factors. We need two numbers that multiply to negative 8 and add to negative 2. And those numbers are? Anybody? Euler? Euler? Minus 4, plus 2? Yeah. Looks good. And so the actual solutions are then the opposites of those. And we can use subscripts to denote them as negative 2 and 4. So remember, r was the exponent for a monomial. Um, which could also be rational, I guess, if, if these are negative exponents. Um, and so, but again, the, the nature of the solution was x to the r. So we want to go back to that, and now that we have multiple r values, uh, we can pose the general solution, if they're two different real numbers, is just y equals c1 x to the r1 plus c2 x to the r2. So for this problem, it would be c1 x to the negative 2 plus c2 x to the 4. So there's a combination of irrational and polynomial. And you can find c1 and c2 using the initial conditions. Um, we will do that with at least one of these. Now, when we solved the quadratic, we could have gotten a repeated root, and we could have ended up having to use the quadratic formula and get complex solutions. In those cases, the form of the general solution looks a little different. Yeah. So, uh, because of the relationship between what's going on here and what the constant coefficient, um, there's sort of a change of variables from e to the gamma x and x to the r that involves natural log. So you'll see natural log showing up. For complete details on where these formulas come from, you should refer to the critical thinking for E8, where it is derived in detail. Uh, but that's it for that problem. Let's take a look at example two. That's the solution. Okay. Good. All right, let's take a look at another example where we won't get two real distinct solutions to the characteristic equation. Uh, again, you can substitute these things into the differential equation and get your characteristic. And hopefully at some point you're able to notice the shortcut directly to the characteristic. So differential equation is x squared y double prime minus 5xy prime plus 9y equals 0. And that leads to the characteristic equation r times r minus 1 minus 5r plus 9 equals 0. Because again, in this case, a is 1 and b is negative 5 and c is 9 if you're using that formula. Good. All right, let's try to solve this for r. It might still factor. It would be r squared, uh, let's see, minus r minus 5r minus 6r plus 9. R minus 3r. Yeah. 
So it's actually r minus 3 squared. So you only get one solution. It's a repeated root. Uh, but again, we talked about how second order differential equations need two linearly independent solutions for that fundamental solution set. And uh, here's the formula for how you take that one r value and end up getting two. In the past, with the exponentials for the constant coefficient problem, we just multiplied by x. But uh, because of the weird stuff going on here with changing from e to the x to x to the r, we're actually going to multiply by a natural log of x. Again, that's covered in the critical thinking where that comes from. I'm just going to use the formula. So you just replace r with 3, and you're good to go. You can find C1 and C2 using initial conditions. And I'm guessing we'll do that with the last one. All right, so one more time for the cheap seats in the back. We've got another Euler equation. And we substitute in the same form of the solution here. And do the same type of simplification, and we'll end up with r times r minus 1 plus 3r plus 2, 0. And this one should not factor. Let's see, r squared minus r plus 3r is plus 2r plus 2. All right, so that's not going to factor, but we can still figure out what the solutions are using the quadratic formula. So minus 2 plus or minus square root of 2 squared minus 4 times 1 times 2 all over 2 times 1. Which we can simplify to get minus 2 plus or minus square root of. This is going to be 4 minus 8, which is negative 4. This looks a lot like that other one we had. So we've got uh, negative 2 over 2 is negative 1. Square root of negative 4 is 2i. 2i over 2 is i. So negative 1 plus or minus i. So you get these complex valued solutions for r. And if we denote the real part as lambda and the imaginary part as omega, then the formula in terms of lambda and omega is given there. Why? <laughs> so again, yeah, there's a really cool derivation um, so here in critical thinking E8 um, where it's explained there. It's also explained in the book. All right, so what's this going to look like for our problem? So what is lambda? Negative one. Negative one. And what is omega? One. one. Right, so remember, omega is the coefficient of the imaginary part. So since it's just i, omega would be 1. So we can just get rid of those omegas. So I wanted to get uh, some initial conditions. Um, so how about, um, you'll notice that these Euler equations have problems when x is 0. 
um, because that obviously either zeroes out everything with the derivatives and makes y zero, or you divide by those x's and then you have division by zero. So x equals zero is sort of a singular point for these, so you would not want to give initial conditions at zero. Instead, want to give initial conditions somewhere else. So let's say maybe at one. Try these initial conditions. So we find the values of the constants from the initial conditions in the usual way. So using the initial condition that when x is 1, y is 1, the equation would be pretty simple, right? Because natural log of 1 is 0. So you've got natural log of 1, natural log of 1, and then you've got 1 to the negative 1, and you've got 1. All right, so 1 to the negative 1 is 1. That doesn't do anything. Natural log of 1 is 0. That's cosine of 0. Natural log of 1 is 0. That's sine of 0. Sine of zero is zero, right? So that whole part goes away. And cosine of zero is one. So this tells you that C1 is one. Uh, so we can actually rewrite it where C1 is just one. All right, now for the derivative. We need to take the derivative of this thing, which is going to use the product rule, so we can avoid using the quotient rule. So I'm going to do the first one times the derivative of the second. Now what's the derivative of this? So we've got cosine, derivative of cosine is negative sine, and then times the derivative of the inside. The derivative of the natural log is Same thing for the other one. You've got the derivative of sine is cosine. And then the chain rule will do, do the derivative of the inside, which is the derivative of natural log, which again is x. All right, so that's the derivative of that. Um, to finish up the product rule, we now do the derivative of x to the negative 1, which is negative x to the negative 2. And then just multiply by this whole thing. All right. All right, so let's try to then enforce this other initial condition. where we're going to let x be 1 again. That hopefully will simplify things. Uh, and y is going to be negative 1. All right, so when x is 1, this is gone. This is natural log of 1, which is 0. Sine of 0 is 0, so that's gone. Natural log of 1 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. x to the negative 1 is 1. x to the negative 2 is 1. Natural log of 1 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. Right, be careful. This is all in parentheses. And then that's going to be 0, right? It's got sine of 0 again. OK, so it ends up turning into this, which tells you C2 is 0.
So then you would just go back to your formula and you actually just bop off that second part. In this case, you wouldn't need that. C2 is gone. Um, that's a graph of the solution showing how it is asymptotic around zero, uh, but can be used for other values nearby.